and I'm going to talk about soft uh, population anomalies. The idea, the approach, and the implementation is PyTorch. And that's, how my, that's my joint work with the data uh, science team in Beersheba SPCF PayPal. And uh, I'm going to talk about how we use this approach to detect anomalies, as well as how we get insights into the data using the approach. So first of all, let me define, def define what an anomaly or novelty is. It's basically a individual or a phenomenon uh, or, group of the, or group of items in the evaluation data which seems uh, impossible or uh, highly unlikely based on what we learn from historical data. So if all, our, uh, uh, all of our historical data are green apples, seeing orange and red apples, most probably indicates an individual uh, anomaly. Unfortunately, most of the anomalous uh, events of anomalous data is um, ra ra rather complicated and not as simple as looking at a single sim sample. So let's look at this picture. This is how now normal, like the big bag, how normal data looks. There are some green, some orange, and some red apples. And this is how evaluation data packets might look like, data sets might look like. Uh, like. All of those packets are in a sorting the sense anomalies, in the sense that the distribution of items in our data set is different from the distribution of items of entries in our evaluation set. And what characterizes these anomalies and how to detect them in multidimensional data is the problem. So you may say in a certain packet uh, that in a certain back there are too few red apples, but most pr in, like in almost any case, since we are talking about distributions rather than absolute quantities, too few means also too many. When we say too few red apples, we also mean that there are too many green apples in the same in the in, in the bag. So what we want to understand is when we look at our data, we want to, to see what is the divergence between our evaluation data and the distribution we anticipated to see from our historical, historical data. Another example is data tunneling, data exfiltration. So data tunneling is a known fraud technology, known attack technique when DNS queries are sent to exfiltrate data out of the network when the name fields of DNS queries are used to send the data. So every individual query looks normal. And you, by, look, by going through this list, you can identify the possible exfiltration, exfiltration request. That's actually the fifth line. Something unreadable in domain drawing com. Uh, this actually generated data, our data generator generates fancy dom the funny domains in the names like drawing, com, attack, edu, and so on. But technically, that's a totally normal request. So just looking at the individual, you cannot say, you cannot say this individual point is an anomalous point. Just by looking at the data set in which there is a skew, a divergence compared to uh, anticipated distribution, you can identify an anomaly of this kind. There are many examples from other fields, not just apples and DNA access filtration. So what you want to do to identify soft or population anomalies is to somehow learn the normal, like anticipated distribution from historical data, and then compute the divergence of the actual evaluation distribution from the historical distribution. However, actual data is high dimensional. 
Like in this example, since you have like 26 letters, this that that distribution. If, if you just count the letters, this is 26 dimensional distribution, and high dimensional distribution are prone to what's called the curse of dimensionality. Okay, everyone heard about that high dimensional distribution hard to reason about, but let's just illustrate it using a simple example. So what happens with high dimensional distribution? Imagine that our historical distribution is just univariate normal, and our disturbance is another normal with shifted mean and lower variance, and we want to see the divergence between the uh, univariate normal, the blue, like the, the historical distribution, the blue on the red hand um, bars, on the hand, uh, red hat, hand plot, and the uh, actual distribution. The first, the first line the row, row is one-dimensional distribution. If you look at the histogram, the histogram is of different densities in the sample site. So you have more, sample with, more samples with higher density for, for, for one-dimensional distribu distribution. That's what, what you would expect to get from a normal distribution, one, one, a single-dimensional normal distribution. You sample more from high probability areas, so you have higher densities more. If you take the same thing but with two-dimensional distribution, then it turns out that if you draw a sample from two-dimensional normal distribution, you have exactly the same probability to get any density. And if you take, that's not a bad thing for two-dimensional distribution, two-dimensional distrib normal distribution is actually the best distribution to detect these divergences. But if you take eight-dimensional distribution, it will turn out that <coughs> all of the samples, most of the samples, have almost the same very low density where they are allocated. That's what's called the curse of dimensionality. All of the samples are allocated on a very, very thin surface far away from the mean. And because of that, you cannot use, you cannot really use density estimation for high dimensional distribution, except if, if you want, if you're able to transform your distribution in a representation where axes are independent and easy to analyze. If you have a function which transforms from your source distribution to a different distribution where all axes are independent, easy to analyze, then you can look at each axis individually and with one-dimensional distributions you can deal with them. That transformation like, is called Gaussianization because the distribution where axes are independent and easy to analyze and sample from is uni unit normal distribution. You want a function which takes your multidimensional data and projects it into real space, multidimensional real space, in such a way that the distribution in the projected space <coughs> is unit normal distribution. And from every point in the projected space, you can go back to the original space. And there was a paper 16 years ago in NIPS, I think, about Gaussianization. The paper is called Gaussianization. You can easily find it or use the URL. Uh, and it talks about a method of doing Gaussianization uh, using techniques available at that time, included iterative independent component analysis, Gauss Gaussian mixture estimation, estimation, estimation of densities, and so on, which is usable for moderate dimensional data like four dimensions and occasionally used for vision and image processing now, but doesn't scale quite, quite well for large amounts of data in high dimensional problems. In the modern life, however, you have much more powerful techniques to deal with transformations between spaces, and of course this is deep learning. So deep learning uh, is able to crunch large amounts of data. We are going to use it for that. Sorry? Crunches everything. Yeah, crunch, crunch, able to crunch everything. And one architecture which is responsible for learning functions which by objectively project between different space is called autoencoder. Autoencoder is a network 
which is built of two networks connected to each other, such that the output of the second network is the input of the first network, and the loss is the loss is a difference between what we got on the input and what we produced on the output. So we want to train such a network which takes some data, passes the data through a bottleneck of low dimensionality, and then decodes the low dimensional representation or a different representation to the original representation. This architecture has nothing like, is not specific for Gaussianization or density estimation. It has multiple uses like encoding data generation, data augmentation, and so on. And this is a powerful techniques used in many areas of machine learning. And we are going to use it for our tasks too, but, but first let, let's, let's look how it works. We'll take data from the example in the original Gaussianization paper. So the data looks like this. This is overlaid what we got in blue and what we reconstruct, reconstructed in orange. And these are three concentric circles. So if we were going to use normal representation for the internal, uh, for, for, for the internal space, this looks very much unlike normal distribution. It has holes in it. it and holes are very bad for pro projecting into a normal distribution because normal distribution is like cloud. You want the holes to disappear from your internal representation. So first off, we are able to train an autoencoder to reproduce the data. Orange is the reconstructed data using our autoencoder. However, in our autoencoder, sorry, we, d we don't restrict the internal representation. So what we get in our in in internal representation is this weird cloud of the internal representation which doesn't look at all like normal distribution which we want to get. And although we get something different, we have no chance to analyze something on it. So we need something. So we need, so we need something to do with the internal representation. So here is what we can do. There is another architecture called adversarial encoder, which is based on the idea of GAN generative adversarial networks. The first part of the architecture is the original autoencoder. It takes the input, produces the output through internal representation. But in addition to that, we constrain the internal representation to be distributed as normal multidimensional Gaussian. We use for that another network called discriminator, which kind of punishes the internal representation for not being normal, for not being Gaussian distribution. And if, if we train for long enough, we get a network which not only reconstructs its input to it, uh, to its, uh, the, its, its input from internal representation, but also follows in its internal representation the normal distribution. So let's look at how it goes with our example. So I'll go with you through a few iterations, like quite a few epochs actually of training. So that's just a couple of epochs. The, the left thing is the reconstruction. It's always good. The medium thing is the internal representation overlaid on the normal distribution. So we, the blue points are normal distribution is what would you want to see there. And the orange onion is what we get. We still have quite, that, that, that sits in its right place, but still has lots of holes in the data. So we cannot actually analyze this day, um, the input data using the internal representation. We want this onion to collapse and cover the internal distribution. So what we do, we train our, our classifier so that the onion becomes more and more similar to the internal, to the normal distribution. The right hand plot should look like the left hand plot because you produce it by sampling from the normal distribution, passing through the decoder, for, through the decoder part and getting the samples in the output space. So we expect to see that the, theory, the three rings. And for now, if you have very good of imagination, you can see the inner ring, 
and the outer ring, but you cannot see the medium, medium ring, so that's quite a lot of work to do. So if we go forward with this training, if you look at the onion, the onion seems to converge to where it should be, but it's still the, the, the reconstruction, the density estimation, the right-hand plot is no good. Another like 20 epochs, the onion becomes very tight and you can guess the medium ring in the, in the representation. A couple more steps and you have onions without almost no holes because what hole in the hole means is that I have in my representation a point which is not mapped to my regional data and I don't want this kind of data. And finally, this is my final result, this is what I want to, uh, to do. I have internal representation which, which is distributed as Gaussian or almost as Gaussian and I have my input data which is perfectly reconstructed. And if I sample from the Gaussian distribution I get, and pass them through, through decoder, I get points which are distributed exactly like my original distribution, which means I can augment my data, I can generate as many artificial data as I want and it will look exactly like my distribution, at least on these two examples. And I can find anomalies and divergences in unit normal distribution with independent axis, which is very simple, very much unlike multifaceted faceted data which I had on input. So how do you implement all of this stuff? I, the, that actually worked, I didn't draw that in, like, in graphic editor, I produced it using like machine learning and I used PyTorch for that. Uh, who's, who's familiar with PyTorch here? Okay, so uh, PyTorch requires a little bit of introduction. So the original framework which uh, uh, comes from the same gang is Torch, which is written in C and Lua. And the framework be be behind many algorithms in Facebook, for example. But Lua is a weird language. Like, you, 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 you may love it, but it's not, not the language you want to make your own, like, only language of data processing. So the same team, through, plus smart guys from a couple places, uh, rebuilt Tor from scratch based on Python with core written in C and C++, but uh, the model and the computation is in Python and it's very clean, nice and dynamic design. Highly recommended. Facebook and University of Oxford, University of Stanf Stanford University and many other good teams stand behind current PyTorch development. So it's a GPU-based tensor library. It's not quite as rich as NumPy, NumPy, but it's close to it in its computational power and efficiency. It has a very nice deep learning implementation because it's the only current framework which has efficient tape-based autograd. So, uh, 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 those of us who deal with deep learning know that you either use standard, standard models or you need to specify the gradient. But there is a way to compute the gradient automatically. It's not like symbolic computation. It is well known in the American computation world, but was less known because it was thought that efficient implementation of that is uh, less feasible for deep learning. So PyTorch takes tape-based autograd and implements it full way and you can use it. It's a Python network and unlike some other frameworks, the code which you write is the code which is ex executed. You do not describe your model, your computation graph in Python, you actually describe your computation and the computation can be dynamic. It's very nice to program in and it's Python experience, dynamic and lean. So I, I would love to walk you through all of my code in, Py, in, Py, in Python for Py, PyTorch for that, but that, that would take a little more time than they have here. So that's just a single example. One important thing which you have in any machine learning, deep learning model is the loss function. 
So for this adversarial encoder, we need a very complicated loss function. And uh, you can do it using tricks and spreading your loss computation along the loop. But here I can, because I have tape autograd, I can just implement the loss function as a single function which not just computes the loss of my training, but along with computing the loss, runs line for another tra training of the another network, the discriminator network, as a sub-training process, incorporates the output of training in the computation loss using a custom function, which I just wrote, and the gradient is computed automatically. And moreover, this is done dynamically during computation using, based on condition whether to train or not to train uh, the discriminator. That's something which is not easily available in other networks, highly recommended. Let's turn to applications. So uh, one application to use that is to look at user visitor activity at the website. Okay, you have lots of logs. You have records with many parameters, and you want to get some insight on dynamics of user activity. User activity has its seasonality. At certain hours, the users from certain places come, and there are changes in activity between different days of week. So what you, that magic picture which you see on the screen is 168 models, one model for every hour of a week, trained on the visitor data, multidimensional, it, uh, once, expi expi once expanded, it's like 400 dimensional data um, de de defining users. And this is like cross divergence matrix. Every row is a model and every column is data. And we measure how data from a different hour of the week similar to the model learned from the tower, or even before we detect any anomalies. So they see there is regularity. Diagonal white it means close. There is regularity. White diagonal means that the data is similar to the model. It also means that the mod data from different days and the same hours are closer than data from different hours. And if you zoom in into the data, we'll see for, for that on any days there are like three squares. And if you think about an international company, there are squares correspond to Europe, Americas, and Far East on the next day, where there are similar activities. And out of those squares, there, there are differences between different activities, but that's not the number of visitors. This is orthogonal to the number of visitors, and that's not even any single parameters. There are many complicated patterns, none of which can be accounted for by just looking at the source data. So even before we do any anomaly detection, by using this Gaussianization and analysis of the transformed data on which computing divergence is very efficient, we can get quite some insights on the data. Further on, based on this data, we can see anomalies related to seasonality, holidays, political events, natural disasters, fraud, fraud, fraud activity, organized fraud. But that's just an example of how these models can be used. Another example is the slide I showed you in the beginning, data exfiltration. And we want to detect data exfiltration attacks in the data stream without fiddling with the data too much. Actually, exactly the same code is used for multiple applications. And the only difference is 10-line configuration file specifying the sizes of the network layers. And these are RC curves for different amounts of exfiltration in the data stream. So as you would expect from population anomalies, because what we want to detect is how different the distribution from the nominal distribution, the more intrusion, like green is 10% intrusion, orange is 1% intrusion, and blue is 0.1% uh, intrusion uh, injection, is like you 
identify the better the more of the injection you have, but for any rate of injection, you have certain re recall for which you have 100% uh, per uh, precision. So uh, you can tune your algorithms so that you define, con uh, identify injection with high confidence without fiddling with the data and without doing any variable engineering, feature extraction, and things like that. That's entirely general. That's, and in another illustration of what's going on, to illustrate what does it mean, population anomalies. These are normalized histograms of normal and injection <coughs> data. So if you look at just very small amount of injection, 0.1, so, and uh, this is, these are the, not a dense, like the riskiness histograms, the algorithm gives risk count, risk score to every transaction. So I have very low amounts of intrusion data. <coughs> the risk scores given to normal and abnormal data are not quite separable, but as the amount of data, anomalous data grows, the same transactions get much higher risk scores than normal data. So anomaly detection depends on how much of the population anomaly you have in your normal data, in, in your uh, data. So just two applications, two uses, and uh, to write the next, what to do next. So when I present this to different people and they ask uh, how to use that and they propose what to do next, they ask me, how can you tell us which variables in which values of variables are responsible for this particular anomaly? So if you look at that, uh, two, uh, two, two banks, the left-hand bank is normal, the uh, right-hand bank is anomalous, and uh, the anomaly is that you have too many orange apples and probably too few red apples, but the algorithm cannot tell you that. It can just give you scores for each apple point-wise, but uh, however, there are no means to explain uh, what to do that with that. Uh, what, what, what is the reason for the anomaly? Uh, extending the algorithm and far, further developing the algorithm so that we are able to say which features and which values of the features are responsible for population anomaly is most obviously, obviously the next step. So that's it. Thank you for your attention. And I'd love to take questions.